Welcome to the third webinar in the KEI Network's full series exploring economic diversification and innovation. Today's webinar features a discussion of innovation and the associated ecosystem. Please throughout the webinar, mute your microphone unless called on and use the chat function for I'll be fielding comments and questions throughout the webinar. Before introducing today's facilitator, let me get you caught up on what we've learned to date about the economy and its resilience through our webinars, former conferences, and the sentiment survey that's currently underway throughout October and conducted semi-annually and has been since 2015. First, the economy, while diversified, is not resilient. And though progress is evident, the economy, corporate investment, employment and jobs, and labor migration remain vulnerable and slow to recover, specifically to shocks in the price of oil for energy and shortages of labor as we're seeing during a pandemic. Both energy and labor are important elements throughout the economy. No region, urban or rural, no sector, industry, profession, or public service can claim to be resilient. We are all vulnerable. But to achieve resilience means change. And the change is not particularly popular, requiring sustained leadership. We have heard that to increase resilience, governments need to focus on three things that we've identified in the policy realm, formulating policies and employing incentives for encouraging small business innovation. Secondly, trade, negotiating trade agreements that increase access to markets for Alberta products and services. And thirdly, education and research, research offering long-term job creation and education, the funding of it and training programs that graduates fill workforce needs. Each must be aligned in contributing to creation of a culture of innovation. And this is where you come in, a discussion of innovation and the associated ecosystem. So without further ado, please welcome Greg McGilvery of Scenarios to Strategy, our facilitator today, a highly regarded champion of collaboration. Over to you, Greg. Ben Fileski, uh, his bio's attached, uh, probably one of the longest bios I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> don't, don't. Long. Uh, Order of Canada, just to name drop, if you'd like. Uh, tremendous philanthropist, investor, community builder. And I'd just like Brian to share some perspectives on the past, present, and future of what we're calling the Alberta Innovation Ecosystem. Brian? Yeah, thanks so much, Greg. And it's a pleasure to be with you all. I think it's a very distinguished panel. Good for your initiative in that regard. I look forward to learning a lot. Um, I just thought I would make some opening comments to set the table a bit and then turn it over to our learned panelists and further discussion. I can offer more detail later on. But I guess as I thought about today's session, uh, I would open up with uh, the shared thought with all of you that we must celebrate uh, technology enterprise in the province of Alberta for the strides that have been made so far. And wherever we look, whether it's on the not-for-profit side with the uh, Alberta Innovates, whether it's in Invest Alberta, whether it's the blockchain embassy, or whether it's the incubators or accelerators, uh, with the good work of Platform and Harvest and Thin Air and Relay and Hunter Group and Builders on the venture fund side, and then we've got some celebrated companies, of course, that we all know about Benevity and Halcyon, um, Emphasis, Neo Financial and the like. And you say all that and it puffs your chest up. The reality is, of course, that while we've got 3000 companies in the tech sector in the province of Alberta, we're still way, way, way behind the rest of the country and way behind a lot of uh, technology developed jurisdictions in the world. Um, I know with anx anxiety, and I'm sure you have too, that whenever there's awards and recognitions across the country in technology, it's very rare that you see an Alberta company mentioned. Looking most recently at the Canadian Digital Awards, where there was no Alberta company in, in the group. I know it also in the largest company available for technology uh, investment is the Canadian Business Growth Fund, which of course, as you know, was put together by a bunch of banks. Um, they've got over a billion dollars. They've made 21 investments thus far, not one in Alberta. And I've talked to George Roselotis, 
Uh, he says, we want to get into Alberta, but we just can't see one that fits our pistol in terms of size. Uh, so what does that all say? Uh, we've made great strides, but we're still way behind. What the hell can we do to accelerate the pace and be bolder, more effective in a shorter period of time? And as Terry Rock knows and a number of others that we've worked with, uh, we've thought through and, and we believe that the only way we're gonna put the ball in the basket in a big, big way and do it on a faster program than we've done so far is number one, to have a coordinated approach between the government and the private sector. Whenever we look around the world, it's that combination of private public execution that's driven transformational change. And, uh, and it makes sense. You, you avoid the duplication that sometimes exists and you give courage and confidence to the bureaucracy to move forward. Um, we also fully believe that uh, a key part of this initiative to improve our pace is the challenge of revitalizing downtown Calgary. Uh, if we're, we continue as a book and abyss, as, as uh, sterile as we are, then we'll never get to the attraction in Austin, Texas. And we've seen the Silicon Valley uh, being hollowed out because of the vibrancy, the music, the arts, and the entertainment and recreation that's available in places like Austin, Texas. We have to get there and we have to get all hands on deck to make that happen. Uh, just to be a, a bit more ambitious, uh, as Terry knows, we've advocated that we have to have a mega fund. We have to have a fund that's big and exciting enough that it just doesn't develop companies internally and organically in the province of Alberta, but it attracts outside enterprise that has to come to Alberta in a substantial way in order to qualify for the financing. The, the interesting news is, some of you know, that there's lots of non-dilutive funds in the rest of the world. In, and the leaders, of course, have been uh, Tel Aviv and Singapore. And others are South Korea, Denmark, and the like. But the interesting fact is there is no incentivized, no incentivized fund in North America. So we would be the only one we've been trying to persuade the government. We're getting lots of traction, but no action. <laughs> uh, so if we could set up a capped equity fund of something in the vicinity of half a billion bucks to get going and a billion bucks on a continuous basis, we couldn't keep the doors far enough wide to attract companies from across the country and across North America. So that's a big thing. And then finally, uh, we think it's time to have a national bank in the province of Alberta. We think that the conversion of the treasury branch to a schedule one bank can be done easily with a merger that we've identified. And by doing that, we'd open the doors in a dramatic way to FinTech in Alberta, to blockchain in Alberta, to open banking in Alberta, that heretofore wouldn't take place. And moreover, enterprises of all size, instead of running to Toronto for approval, uh, could get that approval right here with a very significant national bank. And ATB would become privatized during that process. It could be owned, say, 50% by the government and 50 plus owned by the private sector. But that's another discussion. Um, so on the non-energy side, we think we've made great strides but there's a hell of a lot more to do to be accelerated and bold and gain our rightful place. On the other side, where we are a global leader, where we're shooting, shooting the lights out is on energy technology. There's no one takes a, uh, a, a better seat than we do on um, blue tech, blue hydrogen, on permanent sequestration, uh, on production technology cleanliness. And companies like Air Product, like Dow's recent announcement of, of a billion dollars a year for their ethylene and polyethylene manufacturing, the tech uh, uh, sector in, um, oh shit, another area that I just won't, it doesn't come to mind right away, uh, is fantastic. And that has to be accelerated. 
one thing that we need in this province is the Federal Energy Technology Cluster. We, we know we've got them in British Columbia, we've got them throughout the east of Canada, but we don't have a technology cluster in Western Canada. And why the hell wouldn't it be a technology cluster on clean energy in the province of Alberta where we have global leadership and we could use that significant uh, uh, financial and research assistance and support and profile from the federal government. The other thing I think the technology sector can do is really focused on securing the first award of the Elon Musk's new X Prize for clean energy. And we note as you, as you look at his criteria that permanent sequestering of CO2 qualifies for clean energy. So I leave those initial thoughts with you that we've, we've set the table for general technology development, done great stuff. We've got a hell of a lot more to do, suggested some possibilities. Uh, and one of those possibilities that I didn't mention that is imperative when we discussed with Justin Reimer the other day with Western Economic Development, it is a very uh, jeopardizing and retrograde for the province of Alberta that we have a requirement for hiring talented immigrants at a higher wage scale than any other province in the uh, Dominion of Canada. That separation was put in during the oil and gas boom days. Regrettably, our wage scales have fallen dramatically, uh, but it still is there. And we have to hire tech personnel, as you may know, at a price that's higher than Ontario, higher than Quebec and higher than Ontario. The shame of it is that makes it very difficult. And companies like Mob Squad and uh, Global uh, Tech Accelerator, Sean Luckendall, they're hiring people for those other provinces, but they can't bring them to Alberta because it's too damn expensive. Isn't that tragic? So I'll leave that with you. Just some opening thoughts, and thanks very much, Greg, for your hospitality and coordinating this conference, Perry. Well, thanks so much for that, Brian. I, I took a couple of notes on that, and that <laughs> set us up for 4.45. You folks ponder this, because we're going, where do we go from here at 4.45? I'd like to uh, turn it over to Ling Hong right now. Ling is a rock star. He's been delivering technology to the GOA and others for over 20 years. He's applying AI to help coach autistic people on this autistic spe autism spectrum uh, to uh, work more effectively. Those are bright, capable people that just need a little bit of help to stay focused. So uh, I'd like Link just to share a little bit of his perspectives on the level of cohesion building on Brian's comment, seen in innovation ecosystems internationally and across Canada. Link. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. So I'm actually very typical uh, entrepreneur in Alberta. Uh, I used to be the technologist. I did a lot of engineering work uh, in the IT space. I'm also a certified security specialist. Uh, I'm actually turning to as an entrepreneur because I have a son with autism and I'm looking forward to develop assistive technology for children's service as well as adult services. Uh, the experience I can share with you is what I feel is in our border, we have a lot of revolving doors entrepreneur going through, but it's very difficult to get off the revolving door and actually getting onto more outcome based to uh, commercialize technology because the, the system here and it's very difficult to sell to government. It's very difficult to sell to healthcare systems. And uh, where I see is I think I have opportunity to travel uh, throughout the world with uh, uh, Alberta, Alberta delegation system or Canadian delegation system. What I see in outside of the province and in other country is uh, you can see a more uh, holistic approach from a federal government, provincial government are there to with the entrepreneur to selling to the wall. And uh, that does not happen often in Alberta. And uh, very often you are on your own. And uh, I see, for example, in uh, uh, we all have a technology, we want to find place to deploy and test. In Canada, we have something called BSP program from federal government, but we don't have anything like in, in the same scale in our border. 
So I think that's an area what I see is try to re solving the revolving door, and that will be uh, uh, issues from, uh, I, I think, from a simple point of view, simple things can be done to advance, uh, to help entrepreneurs. That's all I'm going to say today. Ling, I know you had some ideas when we talked about where can we go from here. Uh, 4.45. Uh, okay, cool. You, you can step up to the plate. Thanks so much. Terry, uh, Terry Rock with Platform Calgary is going to share some broad perspectives on the state of the Alberta innovation ecosystem, touching on the excellent collaborative efforts of Platform Calgary. Terry. Hey, thanks, Greg. Uh, I don't know if you can spotlight my video, so I'm going to share you should be uh, able to slides. Share yeah, I'm going to shy. I'm, instead of sharing my screen, I'm just going to use slides here. Um, and I, apparently I need to not blur my background. Um, you have share, you the share screen option. OK, good. Yeah, so my I'm just I'm, I'm using this. I don't hopefully you can uh, you can actually see it. Uh, if you make me big, you can. So if see you what I'm saying. the upper right of Terry's screen, there's a little blue box. If you move your cursor over there, the three dots. You yeah. can click on those three dots and pin Terry, and he'll become larger. Yeah. Than Great. Yeah. It's just a play little... around with views as participants. Got with it. Chat boxes. And... I never know if I can uh, if I can take over a screen. So I, anyway, I did it this way. Just 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 for our participants, Terry. The only thing. Uh, um, that you look, can... I uh, thank you so much, uh, Perry and Greg. Yeah. We lost we lost your audio, Greg. Go ahead, Terry. I can start now? Yeah, okay, yeah. great. So thank you. Thank you both, Greg and, and Perry, for the opportunity. Um, so Platform Calgary is uh, Calgary's designated innovation ecosystem builder. So our focus is on the overall performance of uh, the Calgary innovation ecosystem, very specifically um, where technology um, intersects with entrepreneurship. And uh, we're really talking about, about growing um, a number of companies and the number of companies and, and their number of people they employ and their overall economic footprint. And why do we want to do this? And if you look around uh, the world, we've spent a lot of time benchmarking. Startup Genome just presented its 2021 results. And we know now where Calgary stands globally. And I, my focus is on Calgary. Um, I do work a lot with colleagues in Edmonton, and I'll explain that in a bit. Um, and what we know is that regions in the world that have figured out that they need to put an emphasis on tech as an engine of growth and diversification are growing faster than places that haven't done that. And um, the question is always, okay, uh, well, how do we do it? And this is not a Silicon Valley story. It is not about um, trying to be Silicon Valley. Every industry is going to be impacted um, and affected by um, technology. And so how do we um, just understand where we are? And so we spent a lot of time on that. We now know that in this, in this startup tech startup space, we're one of the 100 emerging ecosystems in the world. Um, and this, this is good news and bad news. The good news is that we actually have a really strong base to start from. There's no place in the world that I would rather be doing this kind of work than Calgary and in Alberta. Because we have dry powder, we have smart people, we have capital, we have really, really tough problems that need technology to solve them right here in our backyard. So we're not starting from zero. We have amazing resources that can come to bear to this. But if we triple the size of our tech sector right now, we will be amongst the leaders in Canada. We will not be the lead. So we really do need to do that. So what do you need to do when, when you know, this is about an ecosystem and Dell Gines is, uh, is uh, with the um, Federal Reserve in Nebraska. And this is a tweet he just said the other day and said, if you're not influencing the system by developing and densifying relationship networks and filling the gaps and support for entrepreneurs in your geography, you are not ecosystem building. And I think a little bit of what Ling just talked about is where I'm, where I'm going with this, is that, we, that, that a dense network is fundamental. And when you think about Calgary, Alberta, as a place that has, that has led in innovation in oil and gas, a big part of it is because of the density of our networks uh, that we have. 
So how are we going to do that in Calgary? Well, I'm sitting right now in the Platform Innovation Center that is not open yet to the public. But starting in January, this is 50,000 square feet dedicated to growing Calgary's innovation ecosystem. Uh, for the first time, Calgary is going to have a single door where people can walk through. Because when we've been doing this work, saying to investors, you need to invest in tech, saying to our talent, you need to work in tech, saying to founders, you need to start a company, saying to corporations, you need to engage startups. We get a single answer after that. It's like, okay, I'm in, now where do I go? How do I do this? Where is the spot? Now there's one door that you'll be able to walk through and the entire Calgary ecosystem and the Alberta ecosystem will open up to you. And we've built um, our, um, the, the space based on three core concepts. So the first one is place. So we now have that single door it is a community, it is a welcoming community that is there for you, that will give you access to the entire Alberta innovation ecosystem. If you're an innovator and you walk through that door, if you're an investor and you walk through that door, if you're a corporate innovator and you walk through that door, you will get what you need faster than has ever happened before. We call it a 15 minute promise that we wanna take two months of search and turn it into 15 minutes. The second thing is programs. Uh, we think of programs as being stage and sector specific. So we need programming that's available to people who are just starting out. They might just even have an idea to people that have been, or have been working on something for a long time. They've actually got some traction and they're growing. And so one of the things that in our research, there's actually not a lack of programs out there. There maybe are some gaps, but it's, they're maybe hard to access. The other thing we need is sector specific programs. Alberta has a right to win in clean tech. Alberta has a right to win in ag tech. Alberta has a right to win in interesting areas like tourism and creative industries. And we need to invest in those and, and FinTech I should mention as well. So we think of this as assembling the right programs at the right time for these people and making them very specific to their needs. The third part of it is partners. And there's a list there. So in the Platform Innovation Center, I'm looking at a place that will be the National Angel Capital Organization's Western Canadian Angel Investor Hub. That's going to be 10 meters from where I'm sitting right now. Uh, down the hall here will be um, something we're about to announce, but a corporate innovation hub led by a multinational corporation with operations all over the world. They will be setting up a corporate innovation hub here. Um, around the corner, there are a number of skill building partners that will be there every day providing uh, up, skill upgrading, training people in marketing and sales, training them um, to uh, code. All of that is available. And then the other part we have is a number of organizations that are um, focused uh, on specifically the entrepreneurs. So we have... Um, we are going to be bringing in global accelerator programs and this all that all comes together so we've got plug and play um, from silicon valley thrive which is an ag tech accelerator coming uh, as well as um, the alchemist is going to be in edmonton and 500 global which is uh, formerly 500 startups these are all setting up shop in alberta and will be accessible under this roof so imagine investors people learning um, uh, startup founders and people, um, uh, uh, corporate uh, people here all at the same time, this, the impact of densifying that network is going to be exponential. We're very excited. As you can see, the goal that we've put together there, 30,000 new jobs, 3,000 new companies over the next 10 years. And this is the strategy that we're going to do it um, here. In the accelerator side, sorry, one more thing I forgot to mention that was on my, Terry, my list of notes. Terry, yep. I want yes. to ask a question right here, and I think it's timely given some of the things that uh, Brian had to say when he began, and, and Ling as well. Yes. Is this a government initiative? Um, we are an organization, here, I'm just going to go back to this. Uh, so uh, Platform Calgary is an organization that is at present owned by the City of Calgary, the Calgary Chamber of Commerce, and the University of Calgary. You might know it as Calgary Technologies, Inc. We've been around for 40 years, uh, but we are we are changing that structure to be member-based. So we are ultimately going to be um, responding to and driven by uh, 
uh, the leaders in the tech uh, sector itself. Okay, so government and the um, institutions of the community helped in the kickstart, but by and large, you're building this as a community bottom-up enterprise. It's it's going to be a, it's everything like this that we've seen that's successful has ha, is what Brian said. It's a partnership with government. So right now we're too heavily government funded. Yeah. Um, but we're, we're going to announce some really interesting things here shortly. We've raised um, over $5 million from the private sector to come in behind us. And then we've got a number of partners that are coming in as uh, sponsors, as well as government funding. Um, Platform Calgary and Innovate Edmonton have partnered to create the Alberta Innovation Corridor, just tie the two big city innovation ecosystems together. And together we applied to the Alberta um, Accelerator, Scale Up and Growth Accelerator Program for a pre-accelerator. It's being launched uh, shortly. It's the Alberta Pre-Accelerator. We're actually we're gonna start with a naming competition. This will see um, ultimately um, uh, hundreds of companies uh, get the earliest stage support that they can from anywhere in Alberta in an integrated system that uh, Edmonton will be the Northern Alberta hub and uh, Calgary be the Southern Alberta hub. And we have eight other regions that we've partnered with to just really wrap it up so that every early stage entrepreneur gets a consistent treatment and support and access to great mentorship. And then ultimately, as they prove themselves out, as they merit it, we get more and more coaching, more and more access to capital, more and more access to markets um, through the process. And so that'll be rolling out over the next couple of months, actually. Um, and uh, we're really excited that we've been able to partner with Edmonton to do that. So that's where I'll stop today. <laughs> uh, you tell a great story, a fantastic story, Terry. Uh, the focus, three things, no more than three. Uh, place programs and partners, goals very simple goals around job creation, the number of companies you want to see, and a complete open door to anyone in terms of partners to anyone that That's thinks right. make things better. Uh, yeah, so. the number on my slide was a bit is low. We've actually now signed uh, 60 partners and we're about to announce an, um, the formation of a million dollar annual prize um, with a, a private sector player that has come in. So that'll be coming out maybe by the end of this week. Um, for startups. So there's a lot of activity underway. Um, right. We're a proud part, uh, participant in the Calgary Innovation Coalition, which is over 40 organizations in the city that work together. So that's fantastic. Hey, hey, you know, you know, when I think of Alberta, oh, sorry, we're not, uh, we're, we're moving on to hear from our speakers so we can engage our participants. I'm going to be a facilitator, Richard, if you don't yeah. mind. Uh, Michael has done tremendous research on the, uh, Alberta Innovation uh, Ecosystem, and uh, he's also been around the Calgary or the Rockies Creative Destruction Lab. I'd like to turn it over to Michael to uh, share his perspectives on innovation here in uh, Calgary, Alberta, even Canada, if he likes. Excellent. Thank you, Greg, and thank you, Perry, for setting this up. And it's a pleasure to be on this panel. I, I know and respect the other individuals who provide some great insights, and I'm going to uh, take a slightly different perspective. They've all been at a macro level. I'm going to start there and I'm going to go a little bit micro as we go forward here. So certainly at a macro level, uh, my experience with the Creative Destruction Lab Rockies program, setting that up a few years ago, has been extremely positive to see these diverse players in the Alberta ecosystem come together and, and work on innovation broadly defined. And so what we've seen in that program is we have these wonderful people who have made significant contributions and raise significant amount of financing in the energy industry, come together with some of these tech entrepreneurs and think about what could the next layer of corporate development look like at the, at the early stage. And the companies in the CDL Rockies program are all very technology oriented, a broad range of technologies, uh, cancer detection, water remediation, uh, battery technologies, lithium mining, all the way into a, a stream was added this year in the egg and food security area. So there's a broad range of wonderful ideas that are filtering around research labs in different parts of Alberta, but also around the world. And that's one of the things we've talked about hubs and Brian talked about attracting good companies from outside Alberta. And that's one of the things that we've observed with the CDL Rockies program. It is open, an open competition to apply, but it's pretty difficult to get in. Um, what we've observed, and it's gonna give some data in terms of uh, how the program has evolved since it started in 2017. Since that point in time, there's been 192 ventures 
uh, attracted and accepted into the program. Uh, 86 were from Alberta, so about half were from Alberta, 107 from Canada, the rest from outside Canada. So you can see it's it's trying to create a profile for Alberta in a specific area. The three areas of strength that we have are energy, uh, egg, food security, as well as general sciences, which tends to draw from across the prairies in terms of, of the people that come into it. Um, the program has demonstrated how having targeted mentorship at really critical points in the development of a corporation's uh, evolution has been very successful in accelerating their development. Just some other random statistics here, but since 2019, the companies that have come through the program, the CDL alumni firms have raised over $320 million US to fund their growth. Uh, 170 million uh, is in Canada and Alberta raised 160 million. So, and then the Calgary region is about 120 million. So you can see about uh, just over a third of the capital has been raised by Alberta, uh, Calgary based companies, just over half Alberta based, but the rest is for companies outside. But we have had some companies move from where they were to set up shop here in Calgary or in Alberta as a result of this program. So that, that idea about reaching out and having a compelling offering to give to the world has been able to attract some pretty high caliber people to this. Now, these are very early firms. Uh, only about a third of them are in the ideation phase. 35% uh, are pre-seed, 22% uh, are seed, and only 10% are, are series A, that sort of later stage uh, in the scale-up phase. So it's interesting that even with this kind of a program, we're getting a lot of traction with the early stage companies. And, and my research has found that one of the things that the entrepreneur has to be able to do to stay in the program is attract mentorship because this is an up or out program. And what, what happens is during the course of the deliberations at the end of the day, the talented men mentors that are around the table are asked, are you willing to support this company? And if no one puts their hand up, then the company is, is not invited to continue in the program. And if someone puts their hand up, they're willing to provide at least four hours of mentoring over the next eight weeks to help that company dramatically accelerate its development. So that mentorship is critically important. And a failure to attract that means that you're not able to stay in the program. So I, I crunched some data. Well, the other thing that happens with the program is that these talented mentors provide feedback to the entrepreneur as to here's what you have to work on over the next eight weeks to accelerate your business development. And it's two to four deliverables, but certainly a manageable number of deliverables. We also uh, assign an MBA student to work with that company to help execute at least one of those deliverables. But I did some, some analysis of what were these deliverables typically falling into the categories. And so not surprisingly, about two thirds of them are in that product market fit area, which everybody says you got to figure out your product market fit. But where I find it interesting is about uh, one sixth are around governance broadly defined organizational structure issues around making sure you've got a compelling capital structure, you've got mentors, you've got advisors, all those sorts of things. And then just over 20% are on the financing piece. And so what I found is I, I did some data analysis was if a company comes in with deliverables that are only focused on product market, they're not likely to be encouraged to continue in the program. So the idea is that an entrepreneur has to have a holistic view of what they're doing here as they develop their corporation. It, it's not just product market. I mean, that's a critically important. Two thirds of what they should do is that, but they also have to think about this idea about how do you build an organizational structure that is gonna allow you to grow uh, successfully in the future. Some of that, uh, I mean, you all know the horror stories where you get the founding team blow up because they can't agree and somebody walks away with a third of the company. And I mean, those simple things, but some people don't think that through. And then also having respect for the capital. And this is where, you know, having our fellows and associates who are the mentors in the CDL Rockies program add a lot of value because they're also angel investors. And, and they say, no, here's what you have to do to be able to raise capital. And it's helping to educate entrepreneurs about how to respect capital. Now, what does that really mean? So we've taken these ideas uh, in the Haskell School and, and created programming around that. Uh, some of the programming I've created recently are around governance issues that you have to be aware of as you go to start and scale up your business. Um, and so one of the things we're talking about, what can, uh, what can we provide? Where are some of the, the things that can help the next stage? I'm coming back to the education piece, which was one of the terms I think you mentioned earlier, Greg, is this need for education. And, and what does that look like? 
And so I think we really have to do a better job of educating and just in time educating our entrepreneurs, like when they need to learn. And, and Terry, I know that's an element of what you're working on as well, and we'll coordinate some of our thoughts around this. But what, what does that look like? What, what can programming look like? As Terry and I have talked in the past, and, and his mandate is a bit earlier in the stage in the life cycle of the development of the companies, and, and the CDL is a little bit later. But there's, there's a lot of overlap in terms of what that really means. So I think we have to get our entrepreneurs thinking differently about what their role is. And um, Sean Abbott, is, who many of you know, I think framed this very nicely when I, I interviewed him for some of the research I'm doing. And he said, we don't invest in founders, we invest in CEOs. And what we have to do is figure out how to create this culture where people start thinking like CEOs as opposed to thinking like founders. And um, one of the things, again, we're talking about at an educational level is there, is there micro-credentialing that can be done to sort of help entrepreneurs along the way that don't want to take time out of their career to do an MBA or what you think they might need to grow their management skills, but just give them that kind of education as they kind of develop along the pathway of of their corporation. So, so that's where we are, and I am at the university right now. Uh, it's it's great to have this discussion. I think it's healthy to open up different perspectives in terms of what we can do next as we try and evolve this uh, ecosystem. And I, I thank you for giving me the opportunity today. Well, thanks so much, Michael. Uh, we're going to get people talking. Uh, if you can put up with two more minutes of uh, overview. Uh, we're going to go into breakouts, just a process check. It's about 4.15. we got another, another 45 minutes. Perry's going to be holding the after party, what he likes to call seances, after 5 o'clock that can involve spirits. Your choice, no requirements. Uh, but we're going to go into breakouts. I'll just give you an overview of the questions that have emerged. And I know there's lots of questions people have been asking. Uh, I've put 22 together in five buckets. That's my job as a facilitator is always ask good questions. Today, we're doing something a little different. We're gonna be asking three questions in the breakouts as to whether or not these are the right questions, are there others, and can we improve them? So uh, uh, just ask you to put your seatbelts on for a moment. I'm gonna do just a quick screen share. And again, you can play around with your views. Just don't hit the red button twice. And I will put this on a wide view. We don't have to read them specifically. You've all received them via your invites. There's a uh, PDF in the chat at the beginning of the chat if you want to copy the uh, questions over or the entire PDF. So what emerged was this idea uh, of an innovation ecosystem uh, focus here in Alberta, but this could apply. There's many of it on the call that are from outside of Alberta. Uh, I immediately went to Stephen Covey. He always talks about begin with the end in mind. Have a look for the forest before you start running at trees. I don't like using the term chopping down trees anymore. Not politically correct. Biggest thing is innovation is about people, uh, process. And many describe it from pure and applied science to concept and scaling to adoption and commercialization. Sounds easy, how come we can't do that? Well, it's because of the people uh, and the players, and we do have many. We have these complex adaptive ecosystems that emerge that no one owns or controls. And we quite frankly, have a tough time even understanding and being aware of one another, let alone communicating and working together. So uh, as we look at the innovation process, as I've described it, how do we define the process? And what work has been done? Like there's been so much work, we wanna champion the work that's been done. Uh, what work has been done? Uh, the second bucket is around the people and players. And some of you may see your, your comments turned into questions. Who's in charge of the Alberta innovation ecosystem? Again, that's the process and the people. Who are the players? Who are the stakeholders? I think this is the Terry Rockism. Who are the end intended beneficiaries? Is it the public? Is it our economy? Is it different players, investors, partners? What sectors are involved? And, and we've touched on a few. How do dollars flow through the Alberta innovation ecosystem? And a big question is how do we promote a culture of innovation across Alberta? Again, not necessarily answering these questions today, but are these the right questions? Are there others? What work has been done to identify the players 
and what work has been done to promote a culture of innovation within the Alberta innovation ecosystem. I like Rainforest Alberta. They have a 10 point uh, social contract where it talks a lot about working together and paying things forward. As Ling touched on, the third bucket is learning from others outside of Alberta. Uh, we talk in our scenario planning work at S2S, we talk about geopolitical influences, things like trade, labor, security, global supply chains, conflicts. But there's also this idea of what can we learn from elsewhere to inform our thinking? And what work has been done to learn from others outside of Alberta uh, in terms of other national, subnational jurisdictions, models, practices, et cetera. Uh, this gets into uh, Perry and Michael's wheelhouse. How do we measure the effectiveness? Uh, Perry's been surveying the Alberta innovation ecosystem for many years and getting garnering many opinions on its effectiveness and how to make it more effective. How is it doing in the end? How is the system performing in the eyes of the end intended beneficiaries? How effective is the system? What work has been done to evaluate its effectiveness? So we're touching on that. And then finally, uh, where I live and breathe is improvement. Everything can be better, even if it's the best, even if we were number one in the world, we can always be better. So what are our ideas to improve the effectiveness of the system? What action would we take to improve the effectiveness of the Alberta innovation ecosystem? Brian touched on a few ideas. What conditions need to be in place so we can reinvent the system or otherwise improve it? Uh, this is where the rubber starts to hit the road, is what time, talent, or treasure would you be willing to invest in improving the effectiveness of the Alberta innovation ecosystem? So let's, uh, I, I think we all care about Alberta. We all care for those of you outside of Alberta. Uh, these lessons can be applied across Canada. We all care about a strong economy, jobs for our young people, uh, fiscal growth so we can fund our healthcare, education, social, and other programs. So uh, with that, I think we're going to go into some breakouts. And really the question is uh, to discuss. I'm going to break out into small groups. We have uh, 32 participants. So I'm going to just randomly put you in groups of three or four. And uh, please take, turn your cameras on now, take your mics off. And have a question to say, are these questions the right questions? Are there others that we haven't framed? And how can we improve any of them? And we'll have about a 20 minute conversation in about 10 minutes if that works for everyone. Any questions on the uh, process? I'm gonna stop sharing. And again, you can play around with your views to see the people you'd like to see. We're going to... Uh, Recreate our breakouts. So you're just setting only a 10 minute limit then? Yeah, so we'll keep the groups relatively small. So I'll set 10 breakout rooms. We've got 32, uh, 31 participants and I will open all the rooms right now. You should get a message on your screen and uh, you should start disappearing. Anyone left behind will have to be with me and Perry. So I encourage you to click on your invitation. Hey Greg, how are you? Excellent, excellent. Wayne, uh, I'm just Good looking for my Wayne. Life. I was very surprised. Wayne is a uh, master in helping individuals identify what's important and how they feel that they are doing on what's important. Implement this technology, how many times now? 2,800 times since 1987. Yeah. Why don't well, you we... back with me, Wayne? Uh, I'm sorry? Why don't you stick back in this breakout room? Oh, okay, sure. Yeah, well, it depends on what you want to measure, but um, we've got over 25,000 constructs and we've been doing it for 25 years and uh, everything from organizational to community work. And, uh, and Greg and I have always been intrigued together about the possibilities of, of uh, really creating great collaboration, both at an organizational level and within the community level. And uh, we even created something called uh, um, Alberta Possibilities. And uh, I think we have that URL too, in terms of uh, what's possible for people and get people engaged in that kind of a conversation. So it's, uh, 
even though I'm not in Alberta, I have a lot of very good friends there. <laughs> You've got one here, Wayne, for sure. Oh yeah, no, no, we've uh, we, we've been aligned for many, many years in our uh, odd way. You, you've been around innovation for a heck of a long time. Yeah. Uh, any, you know, is there any views on those questions that, you know, as you've you've tried to measure innovation for years, I'm sure. Yeah, well, we've got an innovation gap index um, that you. deals with a significant number of structures around innovation, and. Uh, you know, a lot of people, are, you know, measuring innovation is important and uh, like things like having governance on innovation. Uh, I always get that reaction. Governance on innovation? Of course. That's where innovation fails half the time because, well, don't worry about that. Go do this first. And, and there's no real process or governance around how do we measure and how do we make sure we enable people to have those types of conversations. And it's uh, it's mind numbing to me, uh, you know, how, how that goes. But uh, uh, yeah, no, we've been measuring it in great detail. And, uh, you know, Greg was telling me about some of these initiatives and uh, um, just put up a link and let them go in and do some of it. I think the data would be incredibly powerful because uh, innovation is a major theme, but a lot of other things impact innovation, right? Your organizational culture and the way people collaborate with each other and, and how connected people are to their local community. And I know in Alberta, you've got a lot of rural clusters now where a lot of the rural areas are now starting to look at how do we work together? Um, so I think it's a great way of pulling people together for sure. So I love your vision. It's not mine. It's uh, as a facilitator, you take prompts from people smarter than yourself. <laughs> That's where the questions came up. Literally, they just showed up through conversations and I uh, wrote them down, started typing them up and uh, comments flipped into questions. And uh, got Gordon Molnar here. I don't know if we've met Gordon uh, directly, but you're I suspect you're uh, uh, a friend of Perry's. Yeah, so, sorry. I, I was kind of I was just got back into town, and I sort of and I just caught the end, end of your your presentation. So I'm kind of sitting here as a bit of a backbencher, uh, you know, to, uh, in, in, in what, what what your discussions are. So, but I but I but I have been involved in the in the somewhat in, in, in the innovation field over over my career as an engineer and so but I, I'm very very interested in you know the, 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 this topic so I will I know I, I'll, I'll try to contribute to what I can but I missed a lot of the background on which talk oh, about uh, uh, Gordon I'll just give you some background so you've been to enough of Perry's Perry's quite retired he retired from the GOA probably about 25 years ago worked with KPMG as a as a rainmaker, uh, ADM, I think of technology innovation at the government of Alberta, Wayne, just for point of contact. Uh, Perry's run something for over 15 years called the Alberta Council of Technologies, which was pick a technology like big data, find some warm bodies, have a conference in October, November, 400 people, write down a whole pile of stuff and issue findings and find about 15 or 20 of those conference participants that you can can control into starting something around whatever the flavor of technology. And I think he gave birth to about 15 and some of them still exist today. Many of them couldn't survive. Uh, he doesn't really uh, support them too well. He says, you know, if you're meant to be, you'll thrive. And if you don't, you're not meant to be and it's on the people. So he's been a wonderful connector and convener of people. And uh, just about three weeks ago, he said, Greg, would you run one of my weekly calls on innovation? I'm like, happy to run it, happy to facilitate it, not an expert. So he uh, flipped me a few names and uh, here we are today with a really rich, uh, and Terry, uh, Perry will uh, take all the video and produce it into a nice YouTube thing and send it out to all the participants. So. Uh, quite a good conversation. The biggest feedback I received from the people I connected with in the last two weeks was getting tired of talking, even with Perry's uh, weekly calls. What are we doing about this? Because this is really, really damn important. It's our future. Innovation, if you fail to innovate, adapt or die. Is adapt or perish is what happens when you fail to innovate in our, in our capitalist world. And so, the, so I, you know, the, quite often, I guess, in, in my experiences, sometimes quite often necessity is the mother of invention. You know, if everything is is is, is going okay, there's really little little chance to kind of think outside the box and innovate. 
And, um, you know, and I, I always thought that maybe that was kind of the problem here in Alberta, you know, is that things were going relatively good and it's and, and when, but when it's time to innovate it's it, it's too late so um it's uh it, it, it's it's i guess you know with, with wayne talking about establishing within a governance thing yeah maybe you have to think about innovation before you have to innovate to survive so that's exactly what i've been doing for three weeks gordon let me uh let me give you a question to add for the benefit of the group we'll consider ourselves so why do we need a crisis to adapt? And what can we do in the absence of a crisis to improve? Like I think of the Fort McMurray forest fires, the 2013 floods in Calgary, where we went 10 feet underwater in, in central Calgary, and it was just a shit show. We shut down the city, and suddenly 50,000 people showed up at the stampede grounds to team up and go and dig people out. Like that kind of latent capacity when I think of creating and sustaining a movement, that's the latent capacity that exists in this moment. That how do we bring that out? So uh, if you wouldn't mind asking that question as another question that could, could and probably should be asked, why do we wait till the house burns down before we start rebuilding? Is there, and is, it, is there a better way? My answer is, I think the world's a complex place None of us think we can change it. We don't own the complexity. We're just a small piece of it. We feel we can't do anything. Through collaboration and with tools like Wayne's, uh, collaborative infrastructure that I've developed, I think we can. And, uh, and you're seeing great examples with Platform Calgary. They're taking a giant leap into real collaboration. You know, a 15 minute promise to, <laughs> a 15 minute promise to have anyone that wants to grow a tech company in Calgary to get what they need in 15 minutes. That's walking through a door in a real building. That's pretty cool. Yeah, Greg, I thought a lot about that too, because, um, um, you know, sometimes it's, it's like waking people up. I use that analogy sometimes. And um, uh, a lot of times it's to get people really up and awake, you got to give them a good shake. And we've been kind of on a float mechanism for a while, you know, where there were ups and downs and things were happening, but nothing as significant as the change that's going on now. And all of a sudden it's, oh my gosh, what's happening? Rather than, oh yeah, let's just keep up the momentum. Um, you know, because we go through cycles of innovation and, and before a lot of this happened, the, the innovation was not as significant as it had been before. Uh, there was adaption of things that were going on, but now it's all of a sudden, oh, we got to think differently. And, and everybody's kind of getting on that, but then that comes with panic for people who can't think that way, you know, to, to noodle on your information or on your idea. So uh, Wayne or Gordon, would you like to report back our additional question of why do we need a crisis to adapt? What can we do in the absence of a crisis to improve? I think that's a good addition. I'm not, not to answer, but to ask. Which I prefer not to ask it myself or add it because I'm trying to facilitate. So, so you 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 so you 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 want one of us to ask the question to report back. Why why do we need a crisis to adapt? That would be an additional question that's not on the current list that we okay. would like to add. Yeah, if you want, I, I, I can report back on that. If you like, I can ask that question on up to the group. I think we got about another 10 seconds. Okay, looks like we're coming back. Excellent. Well, hopefully uh, you had enough time to kick around. Our, our group of three had one question to add, which uh, I prefer to do jump balls when we facilitate. So uh, I'm uh, just unmute your mic. Uh, Perry's going to work with me to, if you could use under the reaction button at the bottom of your screen, just raise your hand and lower your hand. If you have a great question to add to our list of questions, not to answer, but to add, uh, you can put up your hand. Okay. Uh, I, Peter McKinnon, the esteemed friend from Ottawa, and he doesn't like to blow his horn, but he's done more innovation in the last 
uh, 50 years. And he provided uh, direct comments to the Biden White House on their AI legislation that was highly valued. So uh, if he doesn't have an order of Canada yet, he should get one soon. Peter, you've got your hand up. And you're on mute. Well, thank you, Greg. Uh, that was uh, kind of overblown introduction, but thanks. I'm in Ottawa. Uh, I just wanted to ask a question, actually. Uh, uh, I guess maybe to, 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 um, to, to um, is it Rick, uh, who was talking about um, uh, the situation in the Innovation Center in Calgary. Um, have you looked at other centers across the country? Because uh, Ottawa has something called Invest Ottawa, which is morphed along from original economic development. In fact, the chap who used to uh, run the Alberta Research Council back in the 80s moved to Ottawa because he became the head of the economic development organization the city of Ottawa was running in those days. And uh, that's now morphed into a wide range of support organizations, support capabilities, I should say, for mentor mentoring and uh, fostering all kinds of advice to uh, startups and even housing them in a facilitating kind of way. So I'm just wondering if you've looked into those sorts of things as models, because I think you can learn a lot yeah. because they've already been they've already done this. So uh, you can probably yeah. So uh, we've studied um, um, the the initial set was about 150 cities around the world, and uh, we're um, and then we picked a few that we we really focused in on. So we're we've got close connections to Houston. Uh, Kitchener, Waterloo, Frankfurt, um, uh, Helsinki, and um, Paris, uh, Station F, and New York, so another one. And so we've been actually, we've had the, the, the fortune of coming into it late and really picking and choosing and understanding the Calgary context and, and uh, trying to do uh, a Calgary version. So, yeah. Thanks. And I appreciate that, Peter. Invest Ottawa. Um, is has some amazing programs that are laser focused on the top challenges that their that their sector has that have been very inspiring. So I've got two hands raised, Guy and, and Richard. I would ask if you have questions to uh, new and other questions to offer, or uh, any way that we can improve. So I'll turn the floor over to Guy, and then we'll go to Pat Huffnagel, and then to Richard. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, in the discussion we had, I think one of the questions that sort of might have, I don't know if other participants will agree, but sort of emerged from there, two actually, that emerged from the discussion. I think one of your questions was, what is innovation or something like that? Uh, and then you went on to discuss ecosystems. And I think the, what you really are getting at is uh, the importance of companies in, in, in driving innovation as a way to make money and gain global market share. Uh, if you start at that end, it's probably easier than starting at the other end. But, and the other question that came up was about the role of the state in promoting scale. Excellent. Thanks for that. Uh, Pat, if you let me. Sure. Thank you. Um, and I, you know, I, I don't recall all that, all of the 22 questions that were put forward. So perhaps this is, um, this is one of them. Um, but I guess I'm curious about what gap are you filling? Um, you know, just my little bit of work, there's a lot of sort of accelerators and, you know, trying to connect um, uh, innovators with companies and, and that kind of stuff. And so this Alberta innovation ecosystem, I'm just curious about what's going to be different about it and what gap is it filling as opposed to just being a me too kind of organization. Thanks for that, Pat. Uh, very good question. What what gaps need to be filled? Let's uh, have a look at that. Uh, if I could turn it over to Richard, what's your uh, your improvement or your question, please? Oh yes, uh, thank you, Greg. Uh, my my idea is that um, you know Alberta is sort of central to Canada in a way, 
in a way that uh, it reminds me of what's happening uh, a little bit in the southern U.S. with Texas and the um, the relocating or the new allocating of of Tesla's um, environment. Um, you know, they have the California area where they have a lot of sales there, and they relocated in in uh, Texas. Um, for me, uh, Alberto is a little bit like the Texas of of uh, Canada in a way, and I can see that uh, it'd be a central place for us to um, encourage uh, Elon Musk to invest in Canada into a plant into building a vehicle in in the central uh, Canada. Um, but uh, all this being said, um, I recall as a young uh, man. Uh, uh, Richard, I, I, only, sorry to interrupt. We only have about five more minutes. There's yep. two people in okay. questions. So I, yeah, I I'll be quick. The question might be is what is Alberta's geographic advantage? What is Canada's? A good question. Uh, and, 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 and quickly is also, what is the big project for Alberta? Sure. Quebec had the, uh, had the um, uh, electro, uh, electricity. Um, what is the project for Alberta in Canada? Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, Gordon, you're on mute. And then Derek and David. Yeah, am, am I up? Yes, please. Yeah, I guess probably from, from, our, from our breakout group, I guess the question is, you know, why do we need a crisis to, to have to innovate? And I, I suppose that, that that comes from the old cliche sayings that, you know, necessity is the mother invention, or if it's not broke, don't fix it. So I guess, you know, that, that is the question, you know, why, why, why the crisis, why, why do we have to wait for the crisis? Excellent question. Uh, Derek Ireland, another friend from Ottawa. Yeah. Great to have an ex-Alberta perspective. <laughs> Greg, as you know, I've been dabbling at this very badly for about 50 years. So I'm, I'm, there's a degree of cynicism. But my additional question would be, who is aware of a location like Alberta that replicated a success story elsewhere and actually succeeded at it? We've been talking about Triangle, Silicon Valley, Austin, et cetera, et cetera. And my view is each of them are distinct to that area, they're organic to that area. And therefore the person whose approach I really liked was Michael Robinson's, which was to me a bottom up organic approach that focused on what you have rather than what somebody else has. Right, fantastic. Thank you, Derek. Uh, David Waters, please. Thank you very much, Greg. The, the question I have is how could Alberta take advantage of the political commitment in the last election to create a DARPA-like organization in Calgary. Uh, the Liberals have made a commitment of $2 billion for such an organization, the Conservatives of $5 billion. Is there in fact uh, an appetite to try and help the federal government structure the nature of the DARPA-like organization that might be located, uh, uh, let's say, in Calgary? And of course, um, uh, this could be something that focuses on energy and clean technology, so it actually responds to a variety of the capabilities that Western Canada has. So that's my question. And uh, David, just if you could give us just a 20 or 15 second, what is a DARPA like? How do you qualify that for all in the audience? Yeah, the, DARPA is an organization that was created in 1958 after the Russians launched uh, Sputnik that has uh, created the internet, it uh, has created GPS, um, it has created uh, a range of dual use technologies that have military and then a civilian application. It has been replicated in a number of countries, including in the US, and again, focused on energy, which to me might be the relevant circumstance for Calgary and Alberta. Excellent, thanks for that, David. Uh, I'd just like to let anyone that's got Alberta on their driver's license, uh, we're being shown up by a bunch of people in Ottawa. Uh, so David, uh, I, uh, Stephen Fanjoy is up next, and then we'll get to Ian Denny. Actually riffing on uh, what we what David just said and, and what Pat just said on something that I've, uh, that has been central to what my examination of innovation and in, in, uh, in, different jurisdictions around the world is what 
what are the major unsolved problems that either the government of Canada or the government of Alberta or major corporations in Alberta um, are awake at night about that there is no commercial off the shelf solution. Those problems are either failing to deliver value to those corporations or to uh, the people of Alberta or are costing more than they should in order to be effective. And how can an innovation strategy in Alberta basically tap into um, innovators to help solve those problems? Um, because the biggest challenge, you know, there can be creativity and people can come up with lots of ideas and that's one way of, of, of creating new businesses. So Richard was talking about Elon Musk. Well, all of what Elon Musk has done that's got all the attention is because he became uh, a multi-billionaire billionaire over PayPal. So um, uh, PayPal was a good innovation, but after that, um, he was starting from a running start. Uh, and uh, But it's important to note, like if we look at SpaceX, that's basically solving the problem that uh, NASA had and the U.S. government had. Uh, they want to build space commercialization and science but they're not very efficient at doing it. So they're contracting out. Um, so I would, I would say find something that native corporations to Alberta or the province, that's an unmet problem. And how can you tap into the research community, tap into the entrepreneurial community, tap into the investment community to solve that problem. And if it's a problem that can be replicated in other corporations and other jurisdictions around the world, then you've created a global industry. Stephen, is that not what the federal government did with innovation clusters? Are you simply recommended we develop an or several innovation clusters in Alberta? Uh, I wouldn't, in my observation, I've never seen Canada do this ever. Um, yet it's called the, the formal practice is called procurement of innovation. It uh, arguably, emerged out of the S Small Business Act in the U.S. Uh, but basically, if you look at U.S. and Silicon Valley, what really started there was government saying we need things. And um, mostly it was driven by the Cold War and uh, the defense industry, but everything that they produced ended up having dual use. Um, but you know, like look at Israel, like I put a link there of an article I read today about the, um, uh, uh, the, the program in Israel, which links government, unmet needs, uh, academia, capital and entrepreneurs. That's great advice, Stephen. Uh, I do, anyone can go into the chat and copy the entire chat or any piece that they like. Uh, we're going to move into just have my alarm go for our 445. If people can start thinking, we're going to hear a last from Ian Denny, who is a guy that's forgotten more about innovation than I ever knew. Uh, very good friend, also someone I respect tremendously. He's got an MBA. He's been working for outfits like Synovus in the past, uh, applying like Russian innovation systems that they developed in through this uh, Cold War, different technologies. But as we hear from Ian to take us home and wrap up on our our engagement piece. I'd like each of you to think about one idea about where we can go from here. I'd like to build on Pat Huffnagel Smith's idea of, you know, where's the gap for us, at least here in Alberta? And uh, so start working that question as you hear from Ian, and then we'll, uh, we'll be wrapping up just a little bit before five o'clock. So Ian, please uh, say something profound. Uh, thank you. I'll, I'll thank uh, Mr. Fanjoy for teeing it up, uh, saying, what problem are we trying to solve? So innovation and solving problems is really cruxed in what, what problem we're solving. Um, I, I think a lot of the support methods are uh, typically entrepreneurial support. So I need funding, I need mentorship, I need guidance. Um, those things are all required for the innovation process. But more, more specifically, relating to the innovation ecosystem, we need to have a, a way to make things repeatable for people. It needs to be a commonly or known process, which I think uh, Platform was, uh, was repping and, and, and speaking to. But more specifically, there's 
my background, I've got a number of training, but systematic innovation is really about thinking about your problems, right? Like kudo to Mr. Fandroy. Um, you need to understand what it is you're solving, wh what the market is. Um, I guess generally I'll just, I'll close on saying that, you know, you need structure around what it is you're trying to do. And then within that structure, there's, you know, you need to take the, the lid off. You need to test systems, test people's thinking. Uh, and the most important thing we could derive in, in Alberta is epiphanies. And epiphanies where somebody sees the problem in a new way, in a new light, Alberta will differentiate itself by quality of solution. So one of the things I advocate for, and I'll finish on this, Greg, is we should be driving for the highest quality solution, not, not just a solution, but if it's the highest quality solution, it will give us legs, it'll give us um, fortitude to stand up against competition. And I'll leave it at that. Uh, that was a profound, thank you, Ian. Epiphanies. Uh, we've been working on this uh, for probably at least 25 years here in Alberta. And we've been around this innovation block. Done a lot of energy related innovation. Here we are today in uh, October of 2021. We know we're, uh, the house is burning. It hasn't burnt down quite yet, but it's uh, not far from it in, in some respects. People are hurt. There's issues around mental health, addiction, violence, and uh, we need to do better. And we need to work together to make it all better. So we focus on the Alberta innovation ecosystem. I'd ask each of you just to take 30 seconds and just, and this is our secret sauce at S2S, is get people thinking independently before someone says anything. But where do we go from here? Where can we go from here? Where should we go from here? And we all have differing levels of knowledge on what's, what's happening today, what happened yesterday, but let's focus on tomorrow. So I'll just be, a, just give us a silence for about 30 seconds. If, uh, if Justin Trudeau, Jason Kenney, our new, new mayor of Calgary and Edmonton were all here, what would you say? Where do we go from here? Just think about it independently for about 15 seconds. And when you're ready with the brilliant answer, put your hand up and we'll just go around the table uh, for about another five to seven right. minutes and then we'll wrap. So if you're ready with a, where do we go from here? Uh, put your hand up and I'll get to you. And that, the answer to that question is balled up and what have we done and where do we go and what can we do? Take a deep breath, let the field do the work. I'm a big quantum mechanics guy. If you suspend direct action, great ideas will emerge. I'm gonna go back to one of our speakers first, uh, Ling Hong. And then I'll go to Yogi, who we haven't heard from, uh, David, Peter, Doug, and, uh, and just put your hand up when you're ready to talk. So Ling, you've got the floor for 15 seconds. So what we need is not just one session. We all talk about, we go home, feel good, have a drink and forget about. What we need is a structure for us to moving forward. Whether we continue this discussion, voice this, and uh, they engage people like Terry and other people. We need a structure. How do we do that? Like uh, tomorrow morning, I need to talk to someone. Who should I call? I think that's, that is a burning Who's question for many, many entrepreneurs. Yogi, thanks, Ling. Yogi. Thank you. I guess what I'd throw out there is, do we need government? I see the example of DARPA, which I really like thrown out, and it was triggered, as was stated, by a crisis. So maybe all we need from government is to declare a crisis to focus everyone. And perhaps we don't need that much money. There may be enough funding and enough talent to not worry about money. Excellent. Uh, Doug McClellan, please. I, I guess my view is uh, the thoughts today are net zero, even our new mayor has talked about a climate crisis, but uh, the whole talk of the day is about that. And how do we assist getting there with new and, and national ideas? Um, 
I have a bunch, but the idea is we need to be working on things that the public perceives right now as a crisis. Fantastic. Good to see you, Doug. Uh, uh, Wayne, we haven't heard from Wayne Clancy, who's a technology wizard from uh, Ontario. Yeah, I think you, you, when it comes to this dependency on government and innovation to fund things, um, I, I, we see the biggest challenges or the biggest opportunities are engaging larger numbers of people. So don't keep it isolated to organizational boardrooms, to work teams and everything else. How do we engage the citizens and the public? Because the citizens work are, are the employees. They're also the, you know, they're, they're consumers, they're voters, they're all those things. And there's so many ideas once we tap into their way of thinking as well and help and technology today allows us to do that. And sometimes the most innovative thoughts and the ways of supporting innovation occur when it, it comes from an unlikely source. And we found that some of the greatest things are just engaging the, the, everyone in the process and helping them understand. And we also get more buy-in and ownership and support of what's going on when people feel that they're a part of that development. That's fantastic, Wayne. Thanks for that perspective. I've always said there is only one taxpayer and it is us. <laughs> so, uh, Peter, please, Peter McKinnon. Uh, thanks, uh, Greg. Well, I'd be quick on suggesting that uh, Alberta should play to its strengths, which is obvious. We've said a lot about what I'm about to say, but I've got to, in terms of organizational things, I think Alberta can contribute to reducing the impact of climate change with new clean energy. And I suggest hydrogen, uh, this is no particular order, but these are just examples, hydrogen, synthetic fuels, and uh, small modular reactors, and even using the small modular reactors to perhaps do the conversion of water through electrolysis to get hydrogen or through the petroleum patch to get the hydrogen, as well as through synthetic fuels. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, David Waters, please. Okay. I'm going to build on the comments that, that Ian Denny made uh, about having a repeatable innovation process. I think that is fundamental to really achieving sustainable progress in, in innovation and economic development. And to me, that implies, though, that you must have government and the private sector in particular with the academic sector meeting on a constant basis in terms of looking at the issues that they're trying to, to face. There's such a competitive environment that, that, that you can't just do a periodic review once every couple of years. You have to have a, a sustained approach. Government is needed because of the issues that have been talked about, the impact on procurement, the impact on taxation, regulation, trade issues. So you need to have them very much at the, the table. To me, it should be led by the private sector, though, in my particular view. So I'm really looking at a structure that combines Finds government and, and business on an ongoing basis, so it isn't done on a periodic, uh, uh, you know, kind of structure that integrates then research and innovation strategy with industrial strategy, with trade strategy, and then with skills strategy. The kind of training and immigration that is needed to be able to fuel all of that. So that, to me, is the package that uh, would be important for Alberta. Absolutely beautiful, David. Thank you. Uh, and we're winding down again thereafter. Uh, I'd like to turn it over to Barry in a minute or three. Uh, we probably get room for two more hands up. I'd like to turn it over to Guy and uh, hear his brilliance. Well, um, tough, tough uh, group to follow, actually. Um, so, in addition to all the good advice you've already got, let me suggest. Um, that there are some revealed strengths in Alberta. I don't know exactly what they are. I assume they're in carbon sequestration and advanced technologies in different ways, but you, you guys know who they are. And I think the next stage to help these things is to develop an accelerator that will enable them to get to global scale and compete on that scale uh, as rapidly as possible. And that will require the sort of thing that David was talking about and some other people were talking about. But I think you probably do already have potential leaders and you should analyze their situation and develop a strategy around an acceleration to a okay, global well, scale. I think uh, I'll let Jason Riberio, former Calgary Economic Development, uh, take us home. 
with the last comment on where we go from here. Thanks, Greg. And, uh, you know, I'm coming in late to this because I had to, to drop out, but the, just a few quick points. I think the first thing, and I don't know if this was touched upon in the breakout rooms, as much as the discussion today is focused on, you know, the innovation ecosystem and what players in the ecosystem can do, um, taking the 10,000 foot view, if government does not get the basics right, uh, and those basics are education and healthcare, if, if there are own goals in those two domains and they are big own goals, everything that we do on the side here in terms of the ecosystem innovation will be for naught. Uh, they can't be papered over with, with schemes and marketing ploys, et cetera. We just need to do the, the basics right um, in, in a trusted manner. So avoiding own goals, uh, I think is gonna be critical for getting the talent and all the things downstream we need at the government level. Second, I really enjoyed the point around getting citizens involved uh, a lot of people feel as though their things are happening to them, not with them. And we really haven't figured out a way to engage citizens in the learning ecosystem at scale, engage uh, citizens um, beyond, you know, minor open data challenges that only the nerdiest of Calgarians are, are participating. And we, we need a sort of call to action that I think spans, spans this city at least, and then we can talk about the province. Third, um, you know, all these sector analyses have been done of where our strengths are. If that's where our strengths uh, really are in, in the sectors that have been outlined that we all know, they'll do fine. Uh, they're, they've got the right people. They're great. What we need to do is focus on the structural gaps overall. And that brings me to my last point, which is what Brian started the conversation with. What are we actually missing compared to the biggest and best innovation ecosystems the world over? And if it is structural gaps in funding, then we need to address that in a big way and in a way that people take notice. And secondly, if it is that we have a risk averse government at a number of levels, because we have seen this, the political rope is getting shorter and shorter and shorter. We really need to find the structural gaps in providing capital, but also absorbing risk and reward for government. We, we're right now, government is just de-risking with subsidies. Government needs to have some skin in the game on the reward side as well. That's really, really important and a structural gap I see in all of the campaigns and funding arms that have, uh, that have been outlined thus far. If we can do all of those centered on trust, um, I, I think we'd be in better shape. Well, that's fantastic, uh, Jason. Love, uh, love talking about the basics. Uh, we need an economy to fund those healthcare and education programs. We are the government. I've been working hard for eight years on figuring out ways to create and sustain movements that are bigger than just getting placards and saying off oil, idle no more, occupy Wall Street. So uh, with that, I, know, I always learn when I write and I've got so much written down for the last uh, 75 right. minutes or so. I'd like to turn it over to Perry. Uh, today was just one element of a larger picture here uh, Perry's been working on. So he's got a path forward that if people are energized, they can join in later in October. So Perry? Over to you. Well, I have many notes as well, uh, Greg, and I, I must congratulate you. I, I enter into these phrase with a little bit of trepidation. Uh, maybe it's the wine, but the reality is you've done an outstanding job of getting people engaged and participating. So uh, hats off to you, Greg, uh, and, and scenarios to strategy. Um, I took lots of notes as well. And, and to do a summary, which I really need to do, because as we pass this session on, to the next one, which is the ultimate wrap up of this series, and then get on with what we wanna do from there. Uh, I have the challenge of bringing forth what we discussed today. And I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do my very best, not just with the introduction that I shared with you as we began drawing on this, drawing on this survey in our previous webinars, but taking from the very top with a little bit of seasoning from the wine, four things that I heard today over and over and over again, starting with Brian, and, and wanting to compliment both Brian and Platform Calgary and others, of course, with, with their, uh, their introduction. The four things I heard was continuing the energy transition. I mean, Alberta has an economy that is infiltrated by the reality of energy, but that is not unique to Alberta. Energy is the driver of economies worldwide. And climate change has expedited the need to address our sources of energy for the future in such a way that we don't expedite or, or cr create even further climate change dilemmas. There are technologies. I mean, we've talked about hydrogen today. 
nuclear got mentioned once, uh, and uh, you know I'll make a very pitch as a member of the uh, Fusion Energy Canada that there are sources of nuclear that are now getting social license, uh, and with the emergence of fusion, we have almost a utopia, but I won't go much further than that to say we, we need to continue to address creativity and innovation in, in the field of energy transition. Secondly, I mean, the, the theme of today was an innovation ecosystem and whether it's a system or as Justin Reimer pointed out to us, a culture, the, the reality is innovation is not necessarily popular because innovation can be very disruptive. And in fact, the most profitable wealth generating sources of innovation are in fact unpopular because they are disruptive to industry, to government, to institutions. So an innovation culture is one that tolerates and in fact promotes and embraces disruption, not the status quo. And our institutional structures are driven by administrative principles of adhering to policy and adhering to the, uh, the, the, the dictates of those above. That is not necessarily addressing what technologies are doing today, which is addressing the needs of people. Technology is driven by personalization, which is anathema to the, those that want to have power at the top. Thirdly, leadership. The, the concept of public-private partnerships is brilliant. The reality is we need to be very careful of who we pick as our leaders for public-private partnerships, because most leaders come from the establishment. And innovation and disruption is not what the establishment typically looks for. It typically looks for no shocks. So those that are championing status quo are not the people that we need in a leadership role championing innovation. And that takes me to the fourth point, which is what, what is the structural vehicle if we need, quote, a structure as opposed to a market? And I, I, I emphasize that because I, uh, I'm more than willing to be very tolerant and accept the fact that what we need more of is time and experience. And Alberta being a very young province does not have the, all the infrastructure and the resources and the processes and the leadership yet in place. So it, it may be that the leadership we need is from the bottom and not a lot of high-end drivers, on the other hand, I'm willing to accept the fact that if we are going to put a structure and a leadership entity in place, let's be very careful not to put the established quo into, the, into those roles. And finally, we need to celebrate. And I think that was a word that Brian Mage made reference to early on. This should not be the sky is falling. This should be the opportunity to be shaping the future not necessarily for the globe, but for mom, pa, for Mrembi, and those who in Alberta care about its future. The, the, the leadership must appeal to the energies of the baby boomers that are passing on a trillion dollars for the future and encourage them to invest in Alberta as opposed to giving it to Ottawa or their broker in Toronto. Uh, we need to celebrate progress here in Alberta. We need to celebrate the role we can play in the world at large, but we need to recognize that a fundamental driver that we should not be afraid of is creating wealth. And there are institutions in our province that rail at the concept of creating wealth. They wanna create social justice. I think they can go together. And there is one of the challenges of leader for the future. It's now five after five. Raise your hand if you'd like to stay around for an after party. Uh, other than that, I think you can bring this to a close, Greg, by uh, clicking your, uh, your finish button.